Hi, how you doing? There's a standard trope in boxing history that gets trotted out all the time. When someone's talking about the bare knuckle era and attempting to justify why their specific champion of choice is clearly the best, they tell you that they were responsible for creating an entirely new way of fighting, and that before that specific fighter changed the world, people just relied on brute force. It's a concept I take great exception to, and have dismissed several times in the past. However, in this video, I'm going to tell you the story of one of the most influential men of the bare knuckle era, a man who not only paved the way for many of the most famous and successful future champions of the ring, but also a man who created an entirely new style of fighting. Lieutenant General Hugh Percy, the future Duke of Northumberland and commander of the 5th Regiment of Foot during the American War of Independence, was known to be a generous and kind-hearted man. Unlike many senior military officers of the day, he did not allow floggings in his regiment and was against any treatment he considered unbecoming to an Englishman. He sent food and wine to the wounded of his regiment and even paid passage home for the widowed wives of his soldiers from his own pocket. After a series of disagreements with his commanding officer, General Sir William Howe, he decided to resign his commission and return to England. And it should be of no great surprise that when he boarded the Mercury packet to sail home, he took with him a young slave whose acquaintance he'd made in Staten Island. That young man was named Bill Richmond, and had been born into slavery on August the 5th, 1763, in what is now Richmond Town, Staten Island in New York. There are a number of different accounts of how Percy met Richmond, all of which are possible, but none of which we can conclusively prove. The first is that whilst acting as a house slave at a dinner where Percy was present, Richmond proposed a toast to the king, and impressed by his manners and intelligence, Percy made an effort to get to know him better. The second is that Percy witnessed a set-to where several British soldiers under his command were bullying the young man. Richmond challenged them to fight and beat all three. The third is that Richmond was the illegitimate son of Charlton, his owner, and the meeting had been deliberately engineered in order to help young Bill find a better life without revealing his parentage. The last is that Richmond had taken advantage of the British assault to enlist as a soldier and met the future Duke while serving under him. This theory seems to have come into being simply because there are records of one or more young black recruits by the name of Richmond. As he was only 13 years old at the time, it seems the least plausible. But what we do know for sure is that Percy took the young Richmond with him when he returned home, and neither man would ever return to America. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Percy had no intention of treating Richmond as a fashion accessory or a personal slave, and so sent him to school to get a good education. Once he could read and write, he was apprenticed as a cabinet maker in York, where he stayed for seven years before moving to the capital. The lure of fighting proved too much to stay in the trade he'd spent so long mastering, however, and with a healthy dose of natural ability, a first-class education, and a large number of connections in the fancy, Richmond found himself setting aside his trade and focusing on boxing for his living. Contemporary records of Richmond's prowess in the ring are varied. We have some accounts of him winning, and winning well. During his time in York, he beat George Docky Moore, a soldier who outweighed him by some three and a half stone, 48 pounds. He won so comprehensively that Moore had to be carried from the ring. Towards the end of his career, at the age of 51, he fought a demonstration bout at the Pugilistic Club against the up-and-coming Davis, a man half his age. The fight lasted 13 rounds. 20 minutes, and at the end, Richmond vaulted over the ropes to join the audience for the rest of the day's entertainment without a mark on him. These are pretty typical. Richmond was clearly a skilled fighter, but Pierce Egan, the author of Boxiana, went to great lengths to stress Richmond had never had any formal training in boxing. 
Nowhere is this more obvious than when he faced the future champion, Tom Cripp. The kindest description we have of Richmond in that fight was that his singular movements created much sport. Henry Miles in Pugilistica says Richmond, finding he could not get at his steady and formidable opponent, hopped and danced about the ring, sometimes falling down, at others jigging round in the style of a Tahitian dance. He goes on to say, 20 minutes elapsed without a single blow of any consequence passing. In this manner they spun it out for one hour and a half, when Cribb was acknowledged the victor without being the least hurt. What all the contemporary sources agree on about Richmond was that he was a true master of defensive fighting. That he dodged and evaded blows like no one ever had. That he retreated constantly and struck only when it was safe for him to do so. Hitting him was a near impossibility, even for the great Tom Cribb. This ability to fight and win without taking much in the way of damage was part of what made him so popular as a boxing trainer though it's fair to say that his exoticism probably played a part, as did the fact that he was essentially the ward of one of the highest nobles in the land. But the extraordinary man about whom it was said, the older he grows, the better pugilist he proves himself, was nimble, lithe and energetic, long past any other pugilist, and fought in a way that was genuinely a little different. It's perfectly possible that this was simply the natural fighting style of a man who weighed just over 10 stone, 140 pounds, and regularly fought taller, heavier opponents. But I'm not convinced that that's all there is to it, and I promised earlier that I'd talk about how it was that Richmond created a whole new way of boxing. So here goes. Bill was not an African who was enslaved as a child and brought to the Americas. He was born into slavery. His name simply referred to the place he was born, and so we know next to nothing about his background. So pretty much everything I'm going to say is conjecture, based on the available evidence, most of which is circumstantial. So it's probably best if we consider this just to be a hypothesis and not a proven theory. Also, before I get into it, I need to stress that this idea isn't mine. I came across it when reading an article by Dr. T.J. Desh Obi, Professor of History at Baruch College, New York, whose focus is on the martial arts of the African diaspora. If you want to read that specific article, I'll put a link in the description. Between 1525 and 1866, somewhere in the region of 12 and a half million Africans were shipped to the New World as slaves. North America, South America, and the Caribbean. With them, they brought religion, language, music, dance, art, food, and of course, martial arts. Nearly 40% of these slaves were brought from West Central Africa, an area that is today made up of the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Angola. Angola specifically has a wide and long established martial tradition. While much of coastal West Africa has a long ingrained martial tradition, in the main it's either weapons based or some form of wrestling. However, a large area of Angola has a number of traditions of striking based martial arts. Kandeka is a form of pugilism where slapping is utilised instead of punching. It traditionally takes place as a form of dance inside a circle of other fighters, spectators and musicians who accompany the contest. The goal is to avoid the blows of your opponent in the most fluid and dexterous manner, while still being able to slap them. Ngolo is a ritualistic system of fighting that utilises kicks and sweeps, with an emphasis on inverted position. Hands down on the ground, feet in the air. Blocking wasn't allowed, and so the art contains a large number of acrobatic defences. Similarly to Kandeka, the art was practised to a musical accompaniment. In both of these traditions, it's not the fighter with the most powerful and destructive striking that's admired, but the most agile, the most graceful, the most acrobatic defender. In some Angolan cultures, shields were not used in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and a skill called Nsanga, which was essentially the ability to dodge, twist and jump to avoid missile weapons, was developed. This pervasive idea of avoiding being hit was key to almost all the combat traditions from this region. These arts survived the Middle Passage, and today form the basis of the Brazilian art of capoeira. But there's little doubt that skilled practitioners were enslaved in colonial America as well as in Brazil. 
it isn't too big a stretch to consider that the young Richmond might have been exposed to some of these traditions. Enslaved fighters were often forced to fight as gladiators for the entertainment of their owners, and for the owners of the more successful fighters as a source of profit. In the case of the former, fights were often stopped before any serious harm could be done that might risk reducing a slave's productivity on the plantation. The martial traditions of Angola would have served perfectly. A good example of the latter is that of Tom Molyneux, Bill Richmond's protégé, who fought his way to freedom and earned enough money to buy his passage to England, where he should have been awarded the title of champion. English pugilism, however, was a little different. Two attributes were valued higher than any others. Science and bottom. Science describes a fighter's skill, the ability to manipulate their opponent, to find openings to strike and dominate their opponent. Essentially, how effective a fighter was at hitting. Mendoza, or possibly Belcher, are great examples of scientific champions. Bottom, on the other hand, was the exact opposite how strong, courageous and brave a fighter was, how they could take punishment and carry on undeterred. It's often described by people who don't really understand it as the ability to stand and take a blow, and because of this, it's the source of that damaging myth about fighters not having much skill, just standing and swinging at each other. But in reality, it was much more nuanced than that. It's not about just taking a blow, but not caring whether you do, not giving in, about stepping in with your defence and not back, about blocking or barring and not dodging. Broughton was a master, but arguably the greatest example of bottom in a fighter is that of Tom Cribb. Richmond, however, had a style of fighting that was the polar opposite of Cribb's. He simply refused to take a blow like a man. He milled on the retreat, he darted in, struck his target and was away before they had a chance to reply. It was considered cowardly. A mere burlesque, tiresome, unmanly. It ought not to have been tolerated one minute. And yet his style delighted some of the fancy. The Duke of Clarence in particular. The dance-like defence he utilised as part of his preservation of bodies allowed him to remain hale and hearty well into his sixties, unlike many of his contemporaries of the ring who didn't make it past fifty. The description of his fight against Cribb could well be that of a man practised, or at least influenced, by the fighting arts of Angola. Hopping and dancing around the ring, jigging around in the style of a dance, dropping down to avoid blows, these are all techniques that would have been considered admirable were they not being practised in the highest level of English pugilism at the start of the 19th century. Bill Richmond fought 19 official fights, and won 17 of them. He trained professional fighters and members of the nobility both. And he, unlike many other fighters, genuinely did introduce a different style of fighting into the world of boxing. While he never reached the giddy heights of the title himself, it's entirely because of the respect he engendered and his undeniable influence on the wider sport that fighters like Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, even the great Muhammad Ali, were able to achieve what they did. I hope you've enjoyed this video and that if you aren't already a subscriber that I've earned your subscription today. If you found this video interesting then the chances are you'll find some of my older videos or the videos I'll be making in the future interesting too. Let me know what your thoughts on Bill Richmond are in the comments or just say hi. And to those of you who are still here, right at the very end, FIGHT TEAM!